Before this world was made, the plan of salvation for man was discussed in the courts of heaven, and the provision for man to be saved was made. For Revelation chapter 13 verse 8 tells us that the Lamb, which is Jesus Christ, was slain from the foundation of the world. We have seen that sin has come in and set us apart from God, and each generation has moved further and further away from God. We have seen, however, that God has in each successive generation a people called apart, a remnant that presents a message pointing the people back to the Lord. In these last days, there is no difference. As we pay keen attention to the book of Daniel, we shall realize that the things that were prophesied then are happening today. And as we seek to be established in present truth according to 2 Peter 1 verse 12, we present these truths to you. The state of society, political affairs, religious oppression, the schemes and plots of evil men were all prophesied in the book of Daniel. But at last, at the end of Daniel we are told that Jesus stands for his people. So as we go through Daniel, let us be enlightened by this truth as we look toward the coming of our Lord. Wherever you are, um, it's a privilege to be with you, whether in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening, or in the night. We want to welcome you uh, to the second presentation of, the, of Daniel chapter 2 and onwards, because we'll be doing some other studies after uh, Daniel chapter 2, but we are going to be focusing on Daniel chapter 2 for the time being, and we will be looking at the different kingdoms during this time, during that time, coming up to this time, and we will be applying those kingdoms, their principles, to our time and to see how they fit into our time and how it will lead up ultimately to the mark of the beast that will be coming very, very soon. And um, if you did not get the privilege to look at the first presentation regarding Babylon, I implore you to do so. Uh, just go back to, to the video. It will be a series, so you can just go back to the first presentation on Babylon so that you can have the uh, foundation and you can have a better understanding of what we will be discussing at this time. So we're going to get right into it as we go into Daniel, continue to look at Daniel chapter 2. And if you have your Bibles, you can follow along. Please have your notepad Please have your pen, your pencils, so that you can write down the information. You can make some jottings and you can make references and go back to the scriptures to, to study and to, and to get a better understanding because that's what we're all about. That's what we want to do as we near the second coming of Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. So we're going to get right into it now. But before we do that, uh, we are just going to ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray. Father in heaven, we thank you this evening for your loving mercy, your guidance, your love. We pray, dear God, that as we go through to, to this study, we pray, dear Jesus, that you will guide our thoughts, that you will remove every distraction, and that you will help me to make the presentation clear so that the people, wherever they are over in the world, they can understand, Lord Jesus, the premise of Scripture and what you're trying to teach us today. Bless us now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we get into um, our study right away. Uh, we are going to be looking, continuing to look at Daniel chapter 2. We looked at Daniel uh, talking to Nebuchadnezzar about this dream that he had, and it was a very significant dream because that dream showed the kingdoms from Nebuchadnezzar's time up until our time that we're living in right now. And Daniel tells uh, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, that the head of gold, he saw an image in his, 
in his dream and he explained to the king that the head of gold in this image represented Babylon. And again, if you need to understand uh, the whole Babylonian system and how it plays into our time, again, we employ you to, to go back to the first video and, and take a look at it. All right. But Daniel continues. Daniel continues in his explanation of this dream uh, and, and, and the explanation of this image. Of course, these images, rep, uh, the, the different parts of the image represents the different kingdoms. And these kingdoms, as we had explained in the last video, there are other kingdoms. There, there have been other kingdoms, but these kingdoms really affected the world the most. And you're going to see them as we go through these series. They affected the world the most, and they also affected God's people the most. All right, so we're going to get right into the next kingdom. The head of gold was Babylon, and Daniel continues to explain to King Nebuchadnezzar, and he goes on in Daniel chapter 2, verse 39, and he says to him, And after thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee. Now, of course, it was Babylon that was first, and Babylon was the head of gold and also represented in Daniel chapter 7 as the lion with the wings. But now Daniel says there's going to be another kingdom that is going to come inferior to thee. And so history tells us that the next kingdom that came after Babylon was the Medo-Persian Empire, right? And this kingdom ruled the world from 539 BC to 331 BC. Now, of course, when you're dealing with BC, you're actually counting down. Uh, Babylon ruled from 605 BC to 539 BC. And so we're going to take up now the second kingdom that ruled from 539 BC to 331 BC. And so the Bible continues in Daniel chapter 7 to give us some more details about this very powerful kingdom, even though it was inferior to, to Babylon. And of course, Daniel 7 and Daniel chapter 2 complement each other. In Daniel chapter 2, it is metals in the image. In Daniel chapter 7, it is animal. They are animals, and it's the same kingdom. In Daniel chapter one, uh, 2, ba uh, Babylon is represented as the head of gold. In Daniel chapter 7, it is the lion with the wings. Now we see in Daniel chapter 2, we reach the breast and arms of silver. That's a representation of the Media Persian Empire. And in Daniel chapter 7, we have the bear with the three ribs in its mouth. So we continue to read from Daniel chapter 7, verse 5 says, And behold, another beast, a second like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side. We'll explain that. History will explain that. And it had three ribs in, it, in, in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said thus unto it, Arise, devour much flesh. And so history tells us about this, uh, concurs with what the Bible says. Had said, by the way, God had already predicted this a long time ago. History is now just catching up. But before we get to history, it actually, God had already predicted that the Media Persian Empire would actually defeat the Babylonians. And it actually highlighted the very king that would be, uh, that would be the one to defeat uh, the Babylonian Empire. And so the Bible tells us of this, this king by the name of Cyrus that was predicted nearly oh, oh, maybe 200 years before. You see, God knows the end from the beginning and God knows everything. God knows what is going to happen. And I can rest assured, you can rest assured that God, because God knows everything, he is in control. And no matter what is happening here on earth, God is still in control. You can trust God. And even the skeptics, 
Well, they used to say, you know, Daniel could not have known this. But yes, that is true. Daniel could not have known this. But God knew this. And so the Bible tells us about this king. It says, thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus. He actually was called by name. Whose right hand have I holden to subdue nations before him. And I will loose the loins of kings to open before him the two leavened gates. And the gate shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut in, in sunder the bars of iron. It goes on to say, and this is Isaiah 45, 1 to 4. You can make a note of that. I will give thee the treasures of darkness and hidden riches of secret places that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, which call thee by thy name, am the God of Israel. And this is, this is why Cyrus was called. He, God says, For Jacob my servant's sake, and Israel mine elect, I have even called thee by thy name. And you will see why uh, God actually did that. You see, the Bible tells us that God set up kings and put down kings, that he rules in the affairs of men. And he actually does that for the benefit of his people, for those who love him. It says, I have surnamed thee, thou, 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 thou has not known me. So even though, I mean, he didn't come on the scene until maybe 150, maybe 200 years after, God called Cyrus by name and said, you are going to be the one to come and, and, and take over from Babylon. And he actually uh, freed his people, uh, Israel. You're going to see that as we continue to study. And this is going to be very significant because that actually plays out in our time. It says, speaking of the history of the Medo-Persian Empire, it says the Medes were the dominant power in the region and the kingdom of the Persians a small vassal state. Watch this now. It says, this situation would reverse after the fall of the Assyrian Empire in 612 BCE. This is, this is very powerful because the Bible tells us that the beer had raised itself upon one side. And history is now uh, confirming that. Because the Medes were, it sees a double kingdom. Two kingdoms coming together to make one kingdom. The Medes and the Persians. The Medes were the dominant ones at first. But the Persians took over. And uh, they, in their defeat, as they defeated um, the Assyrian Empire, which was one of the three ribs in the, in the bear's mouth, the Persians took over and became the dominant force. It goes on to say, The Medes at first maintained control until they were overthrown by the sons or by the son of Cam Cambyses, the first of Persia, and grandson of Astyages of Media. And this is the same person that is called Cyrus uh, the, 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 the second, also known as as Cyrus the Great. So this is the same king that was called by God to take over from the Medes and Persians. And you're going to see that he played a great role in the life of Israel because Israel was in Babylonian captivity. If you can remember, the, 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 the Daniel and his three friends were among that captivity. And so Cyrus would come to play a great role in the lives of um, the, the Israelites as he took over power. It goes on to say in, uh, on the History Channel, the first Persian Empire under Cyrus the Great soon became the world's first superpower. Does that sound familiar today? I wonder who is the um, only superpower um, of our time. It says it united under one government three imperial important sites of early human civilization in the ancient world same babylonian spirit uniting everybody under one so you remember we told you that the image each kingdom will uh work in the same way like the previous kingdom but they would each kingdom will bring a uniqueness 
to the whole dynamics, to the whole thing. All right? So it's not new that Persia brought everybody under one. They are following the, the, the Babylonians. It says Mesopotamia, these are the three kingdoms that they brought. Mesopotamia, which was Babylon, e Egypt's Nile Valley, and India's Indus Valley. Now, it goes on to say Cyrus the Great is immortalized in the Cyrus Cylinder. This is that cylinder you're seeing on the left of your screen. I think it's in the British Museum, if my memory serves me correctly. And it speaks about um, Cyrus the Great and how he conquered Babylon. Everything that the Bible had, 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 had um, foretold. It says uh, Cyrus the Great is immortalized in the Cyrus Cylinder. A clay cylinder inscribed, watch this now, in 539 BC, just like what the Bible had taught, with the story of how he conquered Babylon from King Nebonindos, bringing an end to the Neo Babylonian Empire. So here we see history confirming what the Bible had said. It says now, now this is important, Darius the Great. Now don't get confused because because it's a media, it was a media Persian empire, it was two kingdoms, you had different, different kings coming on the scene. You had Cyrus, you had Darius, you had Artaxerxes, he's written about in the book of Esther, and I believe in the book of Nehemiah, all right? So the, you had um, a number of kings that reigned on the throne of the media Persian empire, and Darius the Great, um, I think he was the one who Daniel came across and it was he that was asked to be worshipped as a god and Daniel refused. It says here, uh, and that's it, I believe it's in Daniel chapter 5 or 6 if my, if my memory serves me correctly. But it goes on to say in, in the history, Darius the Great, the fourth king of the Achaemenian, Achaemenid Empire, ruled over the Persian Empire when it was as its largest. This is important. He united the empire through introducing a standard currency and weights and measures, making Aramaic the official language and building roads. This is important. One of the unique things that the media Persian Empire did was to unite the the world under one currency, under one economic system. This is very important because you're good. Please make a note of this. Don't miss out on that. They united the world under a single economic system. This is very important. A single currency. Make a note of that because we're going to come back to that right after. Uh, very soon from this. Now, one of the unique things about the media Persian Empire was this. Their laws was irreversible. It was irreversible and it was weaponized against those who would not yield. Even if the laws were wrong. Even if the laws were bad. Once the king made a law, he could not reverse it, no matter what. There was no discussion. There was no way of going around it. They tried it with Daniel after Darius found out that the law was wrong and it was really uh, designed to attack Daniel. Uh, he tried all night to, 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 to reverse it, but they could not reverse it because that's not how media Persian law works. Media Persian law works in the sense that once it is written, once the king signs off on it, it cannot re be reversed. We see it in Esther. When Esther was, uh, was, was, was the queen at the time under Artaxerxes, and there was a, a man by the name of Haman. He was called uh, by the king as an official, and he wanted worship. He wanted everybody to bow down to him. And Mordecai, you can read it in the book of Esther. Mordecai, who was a Jew and was a relative of um, Esther, would not bow down to him because, of course, he's not God. And Mordecai, who worshipped the true and living God, would not bow. By the way, the same events that takes place in Esther is going to be taking place in these last days under the media Persian principle. 
And so letters were sent out. Haman wanted to, to get rid of Mordecai. He hated Mordecai. And he wanted to get rid of Mordecai. And he convinced the king to send out letters to, to, to basically to send out a contract to kill all the Jews because he recognized that Mordecai was a Jew and so the Jews had a particular way of worship. They didn't worship the gods that the Persians worshipped. They didn't do the same things that they worshipped. And so, you know, they, the contract was to get rid of all the Jews because they refused to do the things that the Persians did. And so, here we pick up from Esther 8 verse 8 where it says, Write ye also for the Jews as it likened you in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring for the writing which is written in the king's name and seal it with the king's ring may no man reverse so it could not be reversed that's the nature of the media persian laws they could not be reversed and so this was sent out into the various provinces and this was to get rid of all the jews because they would not bow down to, Mar, uh, to, to Haman and they would not do the things that they, 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 um, the Persians did. We see it being done to Daniel. Here it is. It says, all the presidents of the kingdom, the governors and the princes, the counselors and the captains have consulted together. These are all the politicians. These are politicians. The governors, the all the politicians have come together. They hated Daniel and again, it was on the issue of worship. Just as it was in Esther, it's the same thing in Daniel. It was the issue of worship. Just as it was in Babylon, the issue of the health issue came up as the first test. And now, uh, under the Babylonian system, the boys were tested in worship. Same thing that is happening here. And this issue was brought up by the politicians of the day. The governors, the princes, the counselors, the captains. The word for captains in this text is mayors. Mayors. They are, do we have mayors in our time? It says, I've consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for 30 days save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. I mean, Daniel's practice was to worship God three times a day. Three times a day. And they couldn't find anything to accuse Daniel because he served Jesus with distinction. And that's what God wants us to do in this time. He wants us to represent him, represent him in a high quality way, in an excellent way. Jesus is worthy to be served. Jesus is worthy to be praised. And Daniel would not allow anybody to disrupt his relationship with God. And that's what I'm encouraging you to do today as you seek to know Jesus for yourself. The Bible says, it goes on, O oh, how king establish the decree and sign the writing that it be not changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians which alter it not. So that's the, 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 um, the, the principle of the Media Persian Empire, of the laws that they pass. It could not be altered and it would be weaponized. I want you to notice that. It would be weaponized against uh, the people. It would be weaponized against the people of God and especially in the context of worship. And people would be killed because of it, right? God's law is given to us to make us happy. God's law is given to us to, to, to unify everybody and to... To, to have peace and to have a relationship with God. David says, oh, oh, I love thy law. You know, when you read the Bible, those who have a relationship with Jesus always love his law because his law is a reflection of his character. And that's why Jesus says, if you love me, you keep my commandments. But the media Persian principle is that the law is used to force. It is used to, as a weapon against those who refuse to do what is wrong. This is a very important principle. It says, and this is, this is a very important um, history 
uh, regarding the Media Persian Empire because we're going to see this in these last days. Cyrus II. Humanitarian efforts are well known through the Cyrus Cylinder. Remember, we told you that he would have brought the Jews back, uh, remove, uh, um, asked the Jews, he would have taken the Jews from Babylon and brought them to Jerusalem. You can read it in the book of Esther and Nehemiah, where Cyrus uh, told the Jews to go back to Jerusalem. Remember, Jerusalem was destroyed by Babylon and they were given even money to build back the city, to build back their temple because the temple was everything to the Jewish nation. And so they, were, they were, went back to build back the temple, to build back the walls and to basically get back their identity. Listen to what the history says. It says, Cyrus II's humanitarian efforts are well known through the Cyrus Cylinder, we spoke about that. A record of his policies and proclamation of his vision that everyone under his reign should be free to live as they wish, as long as they do so in peaceful accord with others. After he conquered Babylon, he allowed the Jews who had been taken from their homeland by King Nebuchadnezzar in the so-called Babylonian captivity to return to Judah and even provide them with funds to rebuild the temple. Very, very important because then this is why God um, predicted that Cyrus would come and help his people. You read it in Isaiah 45. This was one of the reasons he was called. And the Jewish nation went back. You can, again, you can read it in Esther and especially in the book of Nehemiah. Um, under great, sometimes great provocation, they built back the temple because the temple was their identity. Do you remember in, um, uh, in the time of Jesus, the, 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 when Jesus says not one stone will be left upon another regarding the temple, the, the disciples were shocked because the, the, the temple was everything to them. The temple was the Jewish identity. And so the importance of the building of this temple was very, very, very important indeed. And so God moved upon the heart of Cyrus so that uh, he could get back, he could send back the people of God back to Jerusalem to build back the temple. And I want you to see something in these days now, these modern days, let's look at the principle now. Are we seeing the same Persian principle in our time? Well, let's look at it. It says here, look at this, Trump says he moved the U.S. Embassy to, to Jerusalem for the evangelicals. Now watch this now. It says, this is from the Times of Israel, August 18, 2020. It says, large numbers of evangelical Christians in the U.S. believe that God has chosen Trump to advance the kingdom of God on earth. Several high-profile religious leaders have made similar claims, often comparing Trump to Cyrus, King Cyrus, who was asked by God to rescue the nation of Israel from exile in Babylon. Very interesting. Why? Because when Trump moved the embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, it brought back identity to the Israelite nation, to, the, to Israel. That was significant. This was a prophecy. This was a fulfillment of prophecy. And I could go into more into this regarding this prophecy, but we don't have the time. We're gonna, we have to stick uh, with what we are studying. But this is significant. This is significant as it was in the, in the beginning, so shall it be in the end. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there is nothing new under the sun. So we go on as we continue to look at the Media Persian principle. Um, the nephew of John F. Kennedy, Robert F. Kennedy, he made a statement recently, August 29, 2020. He says, governments love pandemics. They love pandemics for the same reason they love war, because it gives them the ability to impose controls on the population that the population would otherwise never accept to create institutions and mechanisms for orchestrating and imposing obedience. Now, how, how is the 
Media Persian principles playing out today. Remember, with the Media Persian in principles, let's look at them. Remember, under the Media Persian Empire, they brought everybody in one. That's the same thing that the Babylonians did. But uniquely, the Media Persian Empire united the world under one currency, under one economic system. What else did the Media Persians do? Their laws could not be reversed. And their laws were used as weapons against the people who would not obey. This is very important. The laws could not be changed and they were used as weapons. We saw it with Daniel. We saw it with Mordecai. And we're going to touch on Mordecai in a little while. But listen to this. I want you to watch this. And that's why a lot of people are protesting these, the, this, this uh, COVID-19. A lot of people are protesting this because a lot of information have gone out and they believe that uh, these governments are using this pandemic to get control of the people. Now, a couple of years ago, a number of people, a number of scientists, civil servants, and other uh, people of the society came together in a number of what they call pandemic scenarios. Last year, 2019, in October, they did one that, that was called Event 101. And there have been a number of documents, a number of scenarios that have been written by scientists and other politicians who have come together and they have created scenarios to tell us what a pandemic, a world pandemic would look like and how the response would be from the governments. As a matter of fact, they have gone so far as to tell us where the disease would come from. Now watch this. One of this report was this that we are looking at now, scenarios for the future of technology and international development. Now, this document was written by the Rockefeller Foundation. You wouldn't believe, if, if, if you don't know the Rockefeller Foundation, then I don't know, you, you, you may be sleeping in a cave for too long. You know the Rockefellers, probably the, the most, the richest um, family in the world. And they had a foundation and they wrote a document um, that was called Scenarios for the Future of Technology and International Development. Now watch this. This was, they, they created a scenario where this pan, a pandemic broke out into the world. Now, I want you to pay attention and read this. It says, and by the way, in this document, they actually identified China as the original place where this disease came from. You can go on the internet and find it. It's not hard. It says, look at this. China's government was not the only one that took extreme measures to protect its citizens, citizens from risk and exposure. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions. Watch this now. From the mandatory wearing of masks. Sound familiar? to body temperature checks at the entries to communal spaces like train stations and supermarkets. Does that sound familiar? This, is, this document, by the way, was written in 2010, 10 years ago. Watch this, it goes on. Even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control, media Persian style rulership, had oversight of citizens and their activities stuck and even intensified. In other words, even after the pandemic had faded away, the restrictions, the authoritarian control was not removed. It says, in order to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly global problems, increasingly global problems, so there will be more problems coming from what? From pandemics with an S, so <clears throat> it seems as if even though this is a beginning, a starting pandemic, there will be more pandemics. Transnational terrorism, the other day, France faced terrorism again. The ugly um, head of terrorism rose where uh, a teacher's head uh, was cut off. Yes, terrorism is back. 
um, to environmental crises. I wonder if that sounds familiar. You know, I was coming up from Kingston and the condition of the road because of the, the rains and the flooding that is taking place in Honduras and in other places. It says, and rising poverty. That is happening right now as we speak. People are going through tremendous poverty because of COVID-19. It says, leaders around the world took a firmer grip on power. So should we be expecting that? I should think so. France is already doing that. It is said that uh, New Zealand is doing that. It says at first, the notion of a more controlled world gained wor wide acceptance. World gain, uh, sorry, at first, the notion of a more controlled world gained wide acceptance and approval. In other words, people first accepted it. But it says citizens willingly gave up some of their sovereignty and their privacy. Hmm to more paternalistic states in exchange for greater safety and stability. In other words, people accepted the government telling them what to do. They would even give up their privacy. Huh? Thing, they would give up their phones and they would give up um, the, 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 the ability for them to be tracked. We will get to that. Citizens were more tolerant and even eager for top-down direction and oversight and national leaders had more latitude to impose order in the ways they saw fit. Well, it goes on. In developed countries, this highlighted oversight took many forms. Watch this. What were some of the controls that they brought because of the pandemic? Biometric IDs for all citizens. Isn't that interesting? For example, and tighter regulation of key industries whose stability was deemed vital to national interest. In many developed countries, enforced cooperation with a suite of new regulations and agreements slowly but steadily restored both order and importantly economic growth. But watch what it says. By 2025, people seem to be growing weary of so much top-down control and letting leaders and authorities make choices for them. In other words, people start to get weary of it. Why do we? Isn't this what um, even our government in Jamaica has done? It says one of the things that they did with, authority, with the authoritarian control was to have biometric IDs for all citizens. You remember what our own prime minister says? that they will push the needs. Remember, it was challenging the courts. And they said, because of the pandemic, they are going to go back to that. This is what the observer has said. Listen to, look at what the observer said. Government vows to push national ID system. And what did he say? What did our prime minister say? The truth is, we now don't have that system because he says we need a biometric system so that we can track everybody because everybody who's supposed to get um who's supposed to get money and who's supposed to get aid from the government if we had a need system it would have been much faster and better he says we are behind in our implementation we still have new legislation to bring to the cabinet and to the parliament but we cannot waste a crisis, he says. Very interesting. What will they be using this crisis to do? Let's look at it. Pandemic hastens digital economy. This is very interesting. Remember what the Persian, the media Persian system did? It brought everybody under one economic system. And this is exactly what COVID-19 has done. By the way, the pandemic or uh, the digital economy, the cashless economy has always been talked about. But the pandemic has hastened it, pushed it faster, like turbocharge. Tur it has turboed the effort of bringing in a cashless system. Remember what our prime minister said, we can't waste a pandemic, we can't waste a crisis. And here it is. And why is that dangerous? Because while there are some good things about the cashless society, good things about the digital economy, what it does is give governments and institutions more control over your financial life. And that's why it says some of these changes could be permanent, it says in the article. 
with long-term implications for societies, economies, and governments worldwide. Digital consumption was already rising before the crisis, driven by gradual shifts in consumer taste, uh, demographic change, and new technologies. The pandemic has accelerated that trend. That this is exactly where we are going. And by the way, all of this is put in place to enforce the mark of the beast. Because under the mark of the beast system, when it finally comes, the Bible says you will not be able to buy and sell. And under the cashless system, the digital system that is now being touted, you will not be in control of your money. They will be able to track everything that you buy. And they'll be able to shut down your, 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 your bank account, your credit card, with a flick of a switch. Goes on. And by the way, one of the things that the media Persians did under Esther, when Esther was the, key, the queen with Naaman, one of the things that they did was very interesting. The Bible tells us that because Mordecai would not bow down to Haman, Haman pointed out, they pointed out Mordecai to be destroyed. Haman hated Mordecai. But after a while, Mordecai said, no, I don't want just, uh, sorry, Haman was saying, I don't want just Mordecai. I want all of the Jews to be destroyed. And so he sent out um, these letters and so on to track these Jews and to find them because he didn't know where all the Jews were. As a matter of fact, Queen Esther was his queen and he didn't even know that she was a Jew. So he had to track them. He had to find them. It's the same thing that they did to Jesus. They sent spies to find out who Jesus was, to find out where he was, what he was saying, the things that he was talking they were what they were calling in this time contact tracing him just like what they were doing in Mordecai's time they were contact tracing the Jews in their time listen to this as a matter of fact you can read it in Esther chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 it says and when Haman saw that Mordecai bowed not nor did him reverence then was Haman full of wrath and he thought uh, and he thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone. For they had shown him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Assyrus, uh, Assyrus, even the people of Mordecai. How would Mordecai, how would Nehaman find these Jews? He would have to track them. He would have to send people out to find them. It's the same thing that is happening in our time. We call it contact tracing. It says here Google is tracking people's movements. All of these things will be used in the time of the mark of the beast. These, these uh, media Persian principles. In other words, Naaman was saying, look, he is the problem. He is the one that we need to get rid of. They are the problem why we are not prospering. They are the problem why uh, these people are, are living different. They worship a different God. We need to get rid of them. We need to find them and get rid of them. They are the cause of the problem. And as you see with um, Governor Como, interesting, in, uh, in New York, listen to what he's saying. He's saying the Jews... Governor Cuomo says religious practices in Orthodox Jewish communities has caused renewed spread of COVID-19 in New York. Very interesting. Nothing is new under the sun. Nothing is new under the sun. And when the mark of the beast is implemented, brothers and sisters, it, they will say the same thing. These are the people who will not bow down to this system. We need to get rid of them. We need to get them out of the system. Look at this. This is in Melbourne, Australia. The same me, uh, media Persian principle. More than 400 people arrested at anti-lockdown protests in Melbourne. It says, Victoria police say protesters disregard the directions of the chief health officer by gathering for a mass rally. Very interesting. 
a Victoria Police spokeswoman told Guardian Australia the force was disappointed to arrest a large number of protesters who again showed disregard for the safety of the broader community and the directions of the chief health officer. In other words, these people are can be responsible for spreading the disease. These are the people to be blamed. They are not following the protocols. They are not uh, keeping six feet. They are not wearing their masks. They are protesting when there should be no protests. And what was interesting was that with the anti-lockdown, these are anti-lockdown protesters. These are people who are saying these draconian measures are against our freedoms. And what did they say? Why were they protesting? They were protesting because a couple of months before, this is in November, a couple of months before in July, there was a Black Lives Matter protest. And there was nobody, nobody wasn't arrested. And people are saying, but this doesn't even make no sense. How is it that we are being arrested for an anti-lockdown, but when it Black Lives Matter, nobody is, is being arrested? It says, the opposition's police spokesman, David Southwick, agreed. Although he suggested there was confusion, remember the Babylonian system, confusion, over police enforcement of protests while referenced a Black Lives Matter rally in early July. Listen to what he says. It does seem in Victoria there is one set of rules for one lot of people, but another set of rules when you are protesting against Daniel Andrews. Now, let me pause here for a moment. Daniel Andrews is the premier of Victoria in Australia. He is a member of the Roman Empire. I will tell you who that is when we reach Rome. He is a member of the Roman Empire. And he has come down with some of the most draconian COVID-19 rules and laws in the entire world. His government actually uh, arrested a pregnant woman just for organizing an anti-lockdown protest. She has not protested yet. Nobody has done the protest. But they followed her. They tracked her on her Facebook account and they sent police in her home. It, was, it made worldwide, um, um, it was broadcast worldwide for the world to see. They came in her home, arrested the pregnant woman before her children and her husband in her home. And she didn't do anything wrong. It's, that, it's not wrong for her to, uh, for what she did under the law. Will that happen when the mark of the beast comes? I tell you, that will happen. It says, uh, go, going on with the article, it says, Southwick said, it was a view echoed by Liberal Democrats MP David Limbr Limbr Limbrick, who attended the rally. Were, were they treated differently, he says? Absolutely, yes. And this is shocking. And by the way, He's a liberal MP who is on the side of Daniel Andrews. Of, of, uh, yes, Daniel Andrews. They, they are both on the same side. But he's saying, this is, uh, this, is, this is unfair. You can't have Black Lives Matter a couple months ago. Everybody can protest. A lot of them don't have on any masks. Obviously, no social distancing. But yet, because of an anti-lockdown, they are protesting against you. You are locking up everybody. This is, this, is, this is against common sense and fairness. I want to ask you a question. Is this the world that you want to live in as Jesus comes? Wouldn't you want a better world than this that is fair and loving and filled with democracy that you can choose? This is what Jesus is going to come to do. Our loving God. He doesn't want us to come under this pressure. Look at this. This is what happened in, um, in Half a Tree. We know what took place. This is another media Persian uh, principle. 21 persons were arrested in Clarendon. This uh, video that we are showing now, this was in Half a Tree. People were arrested for not wearing a mask. Which, by the way, is not truly and 100% scientifically proven. 
Because a lot of scientists are saying it does not work. You will still, you can still get the disease if you wear a mask. And yet, people are being arrested all over the place, all over the world. We have gone this far. This is a, the, the media Persian principle. Look at this. A lawyer dies after begging Colombian cops for mercy as they repeatedly tased him for breaking social distancing rules. This brought chaos in Colombia recently. This was in September. They tased the lawyer to death for breaking the social distance, for breaking social distance rules. All of these principles, my brothers and sisters, will be brought into the period of the mark of the beast. All of these principles. You will be arrested. People will be, will be killed, the Bible says. Your rights will be taken away from you. And that's exactly what the media Persian principle is. But I can tell you, there is still a God in heaven. God will come through for his people. Enforcement of COVID-19 uh, COVID stay-at-home orders. There it is again in the United States. You can uh, be fined. Penalties, it says. And they gave the example of Kansas City, where it says a uh, stay-at-home order states that a violation of any of its provision constitutes an imminent threat which creates an immediate menace to public health. In other words, when they arrest you, if you break the COVID rules, you are considered a public threat to the people. You are considered a public menace, a health menace to the people. This is where it is going. In other words, you are at fault. You are the disease. You must be punished. And that's exactly where this is going. Same thing with the vaccines. Here it is under National Geographic. Vaccines would become mandatory. Here is how it might work, it says. It says, this is the future. As some experts see it, a world in which you will need to show you have been inoculated against the novel coronavirus to attend a sports game, get a manicure, go to work, or hop on a train. And this is supposed to be mandatory. And let me tell you this as we, as we move on, and we soon come to a close. But let me tell you this. Anything that is a force is not of God. Anything that is a force is not of God. And when we see even vaccines becoming mandatory, it was even yesterday I was listening to a program which one epidemiologist came on the program and said, uh, everybody was, you know, clapping that um, a vaccine could be found by Pfizer, the, 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 um, the pharmaceutical company. And he was saying, but we can't just jump up yet because what? We are not sure if this will work. And not only that, he says that even if it works, it might work temporarily because COVID can morph, it can change, and people might have to get another set of vaccines. And yet, this is, called, this is supposed to be mandatory. And listen why this is so dangerous. Look at the next slide. It says, red flags, Soar as big pharma will be exempt from COVID-19 vaccine liability claims. What does that mean? It means that, brothers and sisters, visiting friends, those who are watching all over the world, it means that if you get a vaccine and it, it, it does any damage to you, you cannot sue the company. And you cannot sue the government. That's what it means. But especially the company, you cannot sue the company. And they said it right here. It says, a senior executive from AstraZeneca, Britain's second largest drug maker, told Reuters that his company was just granted protection from all legal action if the company's vaccine led to a damaging side effects. So you can't sue them. And this is supposed to be mandatory. It tells us that governments have granted them immunity from the side effects. This is, this is atrocious, brothers and sisters. 
And here, even our own prime minister says he will give us free vaccine if we vote for him. Very, very interesting times. Let us move on as we come to a close, as we draw this thing to a close. This is where it is going. Everything will be by law that cannot be changed and will be weaponized against the people of the earth. And this man is one of the chief architects behind everything that is going on, Bill Gates. He is one of the ones who are push, one of the ones who's pushing the vaccines and the mandatory vaccines and telling us what to do, telling us uh, governments what to do. His influence in the World Health Organization is huge. And listen to what he says. This is where it is going. This is the next test that is coming. We have the health test, which is, this, which is now. This is what is going on now. And the next test, Bill Gates tells us. Listen to what he says. Bill Gates warns climate change could be worse than the coronavirus. And listen, he's, listen to what he says. The uh, Microsoft co-founder says, we can use lessons from the pandemic to guide our response to the next crisis. In other words, what we are doing now in COVID-19, we should do the same thing when the climate crisis comes. So all these draconian laws that you see right across the world, he's saying we should apply the same thing to COVID, um, to the uh, climate emergency. And who is also with him? As I told you before, he's, he's, he backs the World Health Organization, he backs the UN. Here we have a subsidiary of the UN saying the same thing, the World Economic Forum. It says pandemic policies should also be climate policies. This is interesting. This is, this is absolutely mind-boggling. And as we draw this to, to its final stage, what does that mean when it says the pandemic policies must be climate policies? Well, this article tells us as we pull this thing, pull the curtain on this presentation. It says coronavirus holds key lessons on how to fight climate change. Listen to what the article says and listen to what is coming. And as with the coronavirus said Wagner, Climate policies must push everyone to take heed of the cost of their actions. Whether disease exposure or carbon emissions impose on others. It's all about somebody else stepping in. This is what it means when it says the pandemic policies must also be climate change policies. It says it's all about somebody else stepping in and forcing us. Note the word, forcing us to internalize the, in, the externality, which means don't reply, rely on parents to take their kids out of school. Close down the school. Don't wait on them. Do it by force. Don't rely on companies or workers to stay home or tell their people to stay home. Force them to do so. Do you see where it is going, my friends? Or pay them to do so. But make sure it happens. And of course, that's the role of government. That's exactly what happened under the media Persian empire. That's exactly what is happening today in COVID-19. As Robert Kennedy says, they are using this pandemic to solidify their power. To bring authoritarian control over the people. And you saw it. In the document from the Rockefeller Foundation. But I thank God that God has a plan. God is preparing you and me, my brothers and sisters, to get ready for the time that is upon us, that is coming upon us. And it is only by the power of God that we can get through this. Jesus has already defeated the world. He says, Be, he says Do not worry, I have defeated the world. And I can, I can give you the power to do so. And I thank God that he's going to create a kingdom that is going to be free from sin, free from draconian rules, free from COVID-19, and free from authoritarian rulership. His law will be a law of love. And everybody who will be in that kingdom will serve him because they love him. And as we close, listen to what he says. 
called his disciples one day. Jesus, seeing what is coming, seeing in our time, he says, but Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. You shall not rule my kingdom by force. No, 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 no. My kingdom is ruled by love. See, in this video, they body slam police, lock up and, and handcuff a teenage mother at a New York um, train station for breaking COVID-19 rules. You can see the video as you look. Jesus says, in my kingdom, that's not how it's going to be. It's a kingdom of love. He says, whosoever will be great among you, let him be your master or your minister. Jesus is coming back soon. And he's about to set up his kingdom. The Bible says it will be like a great mountain in the earth. These principles are coming down and to, and the next presentation will be looking at the Greek the Greeks will be coming after the Persians. And the same principles that you see with the Greeks, you're going to see it in, in this time. And then, by God's grace, we'll look at the Romans. And then we will see from there where we are going with all of this, with the mark of the beast, my brothers and sisters. But I want to thank God for Jesus. The Bible says that he's coming to set up a kingdom. And I want to be in that kingdom. I want you to be in that kingdom. I want your families to be in that kingdom. And I want to say to you, if you have any questions, you can, you can, you can, you can write me. You can, you can WhatsApp me. And I'm going to put my, 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 uh, my friends and my co-workers in Christ are going to put up my number and my uh, email on the screen for you to write and to make your comments. There's going to be I believe on YouTube and all of um, and, and, and whatever platform we're going to put it on because we want the world to see it. My number is 572-3394. 572-3394. That's my WhatsApp number. And my email is dburkadventist at gmail.com. That's dburkadventist at gmail.com. Write me. WhatsApp me. Let's talk. Let's reason so that we can get to know Jesus for ourselves. May God bless you, and I hope that this presentation would have brought some light and some understanding to your mind. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you, everybody. I just want to use this opportunity to invite persons who may have questions, who may have concerns, you might not uh, have grasped a, a particular concept in this presentation uh, very well, and you probably have an inquiry. I'm going to put my contacts um, on the screen, or, and you can contact me, you can send me an email, you can give me a, a WhatsApp um, shout out. Uh, as to your question and, and your inquiries. And um, I, I am more than happy and, and, and open to see how best we can address these questions and inquiries and even comments that you may have. Uh, my email is dburkadventist at gmail.com. That's dburkadventist at gmail.com. My WhatsApp number is 572-3394. That's 572-3394. Of course, you will have to put in the 876 uh, era code in order to get that through. So send in your questions, send in your comments. Uh, we welcome them. We want to hear even probably even different uh, perspective as we continue to study this wonderful book of Daniel and the Revelation, focusing primarily on Daniel 
chapter 2. May God bless you. May God have his mercy on you as we continue on this journey. Have a wonderful uh, day.